Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many faces on such a beautiful day. I spend a lot of my research effort on these two questions. Uh, first of all, does diet play an initial role in prostate cancer risk? And does it play a role in prognosis? And you can see from this cartoon slide, all of these things, particularly those that have um, uh, these little um, little blobs on them. Those are particular places where I and others have been investigating the role of diet and cancer over the past many years. Well, I'm sure you've all heard of the phrase, you are what you eat, and you really are what you eat because nutrition is basically biochemistry and metabolism. We can't make our own nutrients. We're not like plants, so we have to eat a variety of micronutrients, that would be vitamins and minerals, and we have to eat what we call macronutrients, a balance of carbohydrate, fat, and protein, in order to make all of these biochemical pathways work. In addition to feeding ourselves, we have to feed our co-inhabitants. So in your gut, you have a lot of bacteria, and it's really important to feed the bacteria, the bacteria play a really important role in inflammation and in the immune system. And there's some particular foods that we and others have been researching that help make the gut bacteria healthy. And that includes whole grains and a variety of, of plant foods. When the nutrient input gets out of balance, the cancer-related pathways are upregulated. So there really is what we call a sweet spot for nutrient intake. If you have too little of any of the nutrients that are required for human nutrition, you can develop deficiency diseases. Some of those biochemical pathways you saw in one of the previous slides, they just simply can't move forward without the cofactors or the nutrients to work. And if you get too much of most nutrients, then a lot of these cancer-related pathways that you see here also get upregulated. For example, if you have too many calories or too many of certain types of nutrients, that can increase angiogenesis. That's the blood supply that goes to tumors. Um, cells can replicate more quickly, uh, particularly with too many calories. Um, not enough antioxidants, but remember there's a sweet spot for vitamins and min minerals, but it can cause DNA damage and mutagenesis. So all of these things feed into cancer cell promotion and progression. So again, there's a sweet spot with nutrients, not too much, not too little, and we use research to drive our understanding of how the nutrients work in the body to optimize health. So in current nutrition research, even though there have been you know, decades, almost 100 years of uh, single nutrient and biochemical pathway discoveries, in the last five years, we've been uh, emphasizing that not any single food has all the nutrient needs for healthy biology. So in addition to studying individual nutrients and all those biochemical pathways and how they work, uh, we're also studying dietary patterns and diet quality. So what are dietary patterns? Dietary patterns is the totality of foods and beverages in the diet and the frequency with which they are consumed. So how do we assess diet quality? Healthy diets are those that are high in fruits, vegetables, lean protein, whole grains, and low-fat dairy. So diet variety is really key here. Remember, all those biochemical pathways need many different inputs. It's not one single nutrient that leads to healthy biology. Healthy dietary patterns are also low in added sugars, and it's not just sugar that you uh, may put in your coffee or your tea, but it's added sugar that may already come in food. So for instance, if you buy a yogurt that has some fruit at the bottom that usually has some added sugar in it also. Or bottled salad dressings usually have some added sugar. Saturated fat, that primarily comes from uh, animal products. It's the marbling on the meat, but it can also come from some plant foods as well, such as coconut oil, avocado oil. Those are very high in saturated fat. And also sodium. Uh, diets that are uh, quite high in sodium are also not healthy. 
It's important to note that highly restrictive diets that omit key nutrients are not healthy because remember, we need a variety of nutrients right at the sweet spot for healthy biology. And the way we measure this in my studies and other studies around the country, around the globe, is we have these scoring systems where we award people uh, or their diets uh, points for consuming healthy parts of the diet, and we subtract points for less healthy components. And some of my research over the last few years is going a little bit beyond um, asking people what they eat, and we're trying to identify a panel of blood biomarkers that can tell us whether or not someone's, you know, sort of blood panel of biomarkers using something called metabolomics um, is reflective of a healthy diet. And, and that work is ongoing right now. I have a statistician very busy on trying to figure out what some of the data are telling us. So maybe I can report on that in the future. So you might be asking, what is a restrictive diet? Well, many of these popular diets that you might have heard about or seen on the internet or even read some of these books yourself, a lot of these are very restrictive. So for example, the paleo diet that's up there in the upper left-hand corner, that's a very popular diet these days, but it's very restrictive. There are no grains, uh, no whole beans such as kidney beans, uh, black beans, which is a great source of protein, fiber, and B vitamins. Uh, the keto diet is sort of the Atkins diet reinvented. Again, it's one of these high protein, low carbohydrate diets. Remember, your gut bacteria like whole grains. They really need whole grains to be healthy. And so those restrictive diets don't have those in them. A lot of these popular books and restrictive diets make a lot of promises, but it's not based on good science. Even if someone says in the preface or in the book jacket that they've done a lot of research, this isn't what we call peer-reviewed research. So when uh, those of us who will be presenting today, when we conduct our research, we have to send our manuscripts into scientific journals. They get reviewed by uh, other peer scientists and go through review, and then they're finally published after a lot of scrutiny. And that's how we get our grants funded also, a lot of scrutiny under the microscope. And these, what we call popular books, they don't go through that rigorous scientific review process. And a lot of them just sound too good to be true. So if it does sound too good to be true, it probably is. So I mentioned that we have these scoring systems, and don't worry about writing all of this down because you'll be able to see it once the YouTube videos are posted. But this is an example of some of the scoring systems that we use in our research. So the first column is called the Healthy Eating Index, and that's basically a reflection of whether or not um, someone's diet conforms to the U.S. dietary guidelines. And where you see a plus sign, that's where points are awarded for eating those components of the diet, fruits, vegetables, legumes, so forth. Uh, the next one is the uh, Alternative Healthy Eating Index. It's very similar to the Healthy Eating Index. The next is a Mediterranean diet score, and then finally the DASH diet, which was based on a controlled feeding study primarily to reduce hypertension. So then you might be asking, well, does this work? Does thinking about these scoring systems really work? Well, this is an example of some data uh, uh, from two cohorts. One was the AARP cohort, and the other is the multi-ethnic cohort. And uh, these colleagues are uh, good friends of mine. We work together on a lot of these dietary pattern analyses. And when you, where you see the dashed line, um, a little over halfway up through the slide, that shows no association for these healthy eating patterns with uh, reduction in risk in cancer mortality. And where you see the uh, shapes with the lines, those are all showing reduced risk for better quality diets across all of these scoring systems with cancer mortality. So what that means is that the men in these studies who had better quality diets compared to those who had poor quality diets by evaluating through these scoring systems had about a, a 25 to 30% um, lower risk of dying from cancer. And uh, similarly, this is for all-cause mortality. So a lot of 
men who get cancer, including prostate cancer, they may go on to die of something else besides their cancer. Uh, so this is basically showing very similar results that a better quality diet with more points on those scoring systems compared to fewer points is associated with a lower risk of, of dying from anything. So calories are important, and we talk about this in some of our research studies, particularly for uh, prostate cancer patients who uh, may need to lose a little bit, bit of weight. Um, but the diet quality is also really important, and diet diversity is important. And what I'd like to leave you with is just this illustration that shows you that it's not just calories, but it is also diet quality. So you see in the left-hand column, it's called the HEI score. And this scoring system has 100 points, with 100 points being the best possible diet that someone could get. And 27 points would be really a pretty poor diet. So this is showing that across all of these, you can get 2,000 calories, but the quality of the diet can really vary. So let's see if I can work this pointer. Is that it? OK. OK. So um, we have uh, four E indications here, morning, midday, afternoon, and evening. And for the good quality diet, there's um, a whole grain cereal, some juice, some fruit, some whole grain toast. Whereas the poor quality diet looks like a sugar sweetened cereal with a lot of colors um, and some coffee and, and no type of fruit intake. So you can have the same calories, but the diet quality will vary. Same with midday, afternoon, and evening. And you can look at these pictures and say, well, they don't look very different. And that take home point is you don't have to make a lot of changes to get a really good quality diet. So let's just look at the evening meal to think about that. This evening meal where the diet quality was poor was, uh, did you see anything green in um, that evening meal? No. And it looks like uh, maybe, I think that might be a piece of chicken. It looks like it might be fried or breaded or something. So some extra oil, some extra saturated fat. Whereas the higher quality diet, there's two types of vegetables and some uh, lean protein. And similarly with the afternoon snack, the poor quality diet is a donut and coffee. The one that's a little bit better is some milk and cookies. But the one that has the highest score is uh, some low-fat yogurt and some fresh fruit. So again, you don't have to make a lot of changes, but it can make a big difference in the overall diet quality. And the, the evidence is showing us that a better versus poor quality diet will improve your outcomes from cancer. So thank you very much.